So we've got two readings this morning. The first is Exodus chapter 20, verses 14 to 17. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And the next reading is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 33. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. So um, I've, um, I've, I've had COVID this week, um, so it's not been fun. Um, I've been isolating in our spare bedroom. No, actually, Kate's been in the spare bedroom. I've been in our bedroom. <laughs> no, that was, it's got better beds, to be honest, our spare bedroom. So she, she had the better deal. Um, got into bed last night for the first time in eight days with Kate. Heart was racing. But that's one of the few side effects I've had, really. (laughs) Oh, dear. I've been sat there going, shall I make that joke? It's not a very good joke. Anyway. So if I'm a bit tired, that's what you'll know why. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We've been singing about it. Kate talked about it. Your faithfulness is everything to us. And uh, we hold on to that. And I, I pray that that above everything, Jesus, in these next few minutes as we look at this, your scripture together, that, um, that we would just know you better, Jesus, and love you better, and know your love for us better. Amen. So, um, I wonder what your opinion of the church is. Um, I think one of the things that the pandemic has done has highlighted that there's actually quite a lot of division within the church. I, I get quite a lot of emails, actually, of people passing judgment on the state of the church, particularly in this country, and um, making comments about whether we've done enough in terms of restrictions. And some people say we haven't done enough as a church. And other people say the church has done too much. Some people say the church should be more vocal about uh, vaccines and things. And other people say the church should just keep out of it and worry about spiritual stuff. And And I get quite a few emails of different opinions from different people about different things. And, and clearly, I think the pandemic has highlighted that there are people with different opinions. And, and, and there's quite a lot of division within the church, I think, which is, a, which is a sad thing. In many ways, the church is less than perfect. I don't know what you think about the church, what, what you think about SML as a church. Maybe you think SML is less than perfect. Maybe you think the church in, in, in England and the church of England is less than perfect. Maybe you have an opinion about the Roman Catholic Church. What's your opinion of the global church? But the church is, in many ways, 
not in a great condition. A number of years ago, this is what John Stott said about the church. He said, on earth, the church is often in rags and tatters, stained and ugly, despised and persecuted. In many ways, what John Stott was doing there was picking up on some of the, that verse 27 from our reading in Ephesians, where it says about the church being stained, wrinkled with blemishes. I wonder if that's your opinion of the church. But here is the good news about the church. Jesus loves the church. And he is working all the time to transform the church. He himself said in Matthew uh, 16, we read that he said, I will build my church. I will build my church. That's his promise. That's his commitment. And this means that he is working to transform St. Mary's Longfleet. And that means he is working to transform the little churches within our big church, our life groups, our youth ministry, our kids ministry, different groupings that we have. Jesus loves those and he is working to transform them. It also means that he loves the Church of England and he is working to transform it. It means he loves the Roman Catholic Church and he is working to transform it. It means he loves the, the church in all its expressions across the globe. He loves it and cares for it and is working to transform it. And if Jesus is doing that, we can hope in the future for the church. The passage that we had read to us, Ephesians 5, is all about what Jesus has done and what God is doing for his church. And he describes his church as his bride. So let's look at this together. What does he do? What, does, what did Christ do for the church? And what does Christ do for the church? First of all, verse 25, we see that Christ loved the church and we see that Christ gave himself up for the church. The word there for love is agap agapate, uh, like agape, but a longer word. And it's the, the, the most strong expression of love that we ever see in the Bible. It is the ultimate word for love. This is the maximum love that you can write about. And that is the love that Christ has for us as his church. It is a love which is strong, but also, as we see in the, in the next phrase, a love which is sacrificial. He gave himself up for her. And elsewhere, he teaches that the greatest sign of love is that you give yourself up to death, which is exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. He gave himself up for the cross, on the cross for his church. And of course, what we see next in verse 26 is that in doing so, in, in, in giving himself up on the cross and winning our, uh, our forgiveness and our salvation, what he was doing for the church, his bride, for us, was making us holy, cleansing us by the washing with water through the word. This is what Jesus did and is doing for the church. He is making us holy. He is setting us apart. On the cross, Jesus separated a people apart from him for himself. He said, this is going to be my people. And that's what we belong to. We belong to Jesus. We have been set apart for him. And if we're going to be holy, of course, then we need cleaning. We need cleansing. We need washing with water. And the water is just a reference to baptism, that that statement, that symbol that we use when people enter into this set-apart family, this set-apart body of people that Jesus has set apart for himself. This all means, verse 27, that we can be presented to him as radiant, holy, and blameless. Those stains and wrinkles and blemishes that John Stott was alluding to are removed. And instead of being stained and wrinkled and blemished, we are now radiant, holy, and blameless. The very things that make us ugly as a church are removed. And the true beauty of us as a people set aside for Jesus 
comes through. We are radiant. We are glorious. But the good news is this wasn't just a one-off thing that happened on the cross. This wasn't that Jesus did this on the cross for one day in the future and then said, right, you know, off you, off you go, get on with it. Go on being my church. Just get on with it. Make yourselves sorted and, and organized and, and just do what you're meant to do. He is permanently working on us. Verse 29, he says that just like a husband, he says he feeds, uh, husband's for his own body, he feeds and cares for his church. Jesus feeds us and he cares for us. There's all sorts of different translations for that phrase. One, another example is nourishes. Another one is tenderly cares. Another one is cherishes. The word care literally means to keep warm. Isn't that a beautiful image? Jesus sees us as a church, as his people, as his bride, and he sees us struggling and he sees us in our mess, whether that's individually or collectively or globally, and he says, I just want to keep you warm. And I think you can read that in two ways. On one level, I think that's about keeping us spiritually warm. He keeps the fire of the Holy Spirit burning in us, keeping us alive, keeping us passionate, keeping us going out for him. But also, I think it just means that he comforts us. And on those cold winter nights, he gets a big heavy blanket and he wraps it around our shoulders and he gives us a hug and he says, I love you. I'm going to keep you warm because you are my people. You're my bride. I love you and I care for you. What's this got to do with the seventh commandment? You shall not commit adultery. Well, I think this has everything to do with the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Let's look at verse 32 together. Paul says this, this is a profound mystery, but I am applying it to Christ and the church. Now he's talking about marriage and he says, this is a mystery, but I am applying it to Christ and the church. The NIV says, I am talking about, but some other translations have, I am applying it, which I think is really helpful. Paul tells us that marriage is a profound mystery, this kind of connection between two people coming together to form one flesh. He says it's a mystery. And a mystery is something that God has chosen to allow us to understand. It's not something hidden from us, but it's something we couldn't have worked out ourselves. It's something that through his Holy Spirit, he's revealed to us. And so this is, Paul is saying that this is something that's been revealed to us. And this is, this is the key thing. And this is really important. What, what, what Paul is saying is that the, the, the fundamental, basic, foundational truth is not ab about marriage, is not actually about husband and wife. The foundation truth is actually about Jesus and his church. That's the truth. That's the foundation. That's the, the firm ground. That's been the truth from the beginning. That is where we start. Our starting point is Jesus and his church, the way Jesus loves his church, the way Jesus cares for his church, the way he nurtures his church and makes the church holy. That is the foundation of everything. Now, marriage is one of God's good gifts to us, which help us to flourish. We know that. It can, and, and John and Liz alluded to that in their prayers. But marriage on earth between a man and a wife is simply a faded echo of that foundational truth. Does that make sense? In other words, we just vaguely represent, our marriages vaguely represent a huge truth about how Jesus loves the church. That's the foundation. We just echo it. We reflect it really vaguely. We're like a pale imitation. We all know that marriages, marriages don't, often don't reflect that foundational truth. That's because we can't, because we're just a pale imitation of the way that Christ loves the church, his bride. Now, Individually, let's talk about individuals for a moment. Individually, I am made in the image of God. So somehow, I know it's hard to believe, but there's something about God 
the creator, the ruler of the universe, all loving, all powerful, all glorious. There's something about that which is somehow reflected in me. And that is true for all of you. All of you individually. Somehow, God, the, 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 the powerful, glorious, loving, light, perfection, somehow something of that is in you. That should encourage us as nothing else does. But we know that as individuals, we are similarly just a pale imitation of God's image. And we mess up and we ruin that image. We spoil that image. We mess up so that somehow we look at ourselves and we know, don't we, that we don't reflect God's image. And we carry the image of God and that makes us essentially good, but somehow we mess up and we fail to live up or to, to kind of reflect what that image of God is in us. Now that's depressing, but it doesn't matter because God loves you. And remember back at week one of all this sermon series, we talked about grace. So don't forget that God loves you, and it's not about how you can earn God's love and his favor. He loves you despite the fact that your image doesn't reflect his image in you. And this is what going, is going on with marriages. And if you have a marriage where there is an act of adultery it's the same thing here is Jesus and the church that's perfect that's perfect love that is perfect faithfulness that is perfect goodness and our marriages are a, I've said this a lot but that's the point are a pale imitation of what Jesus has done. And if we commit adultery, we are spoiling that image. And as Christians, this is so important because our marriages don't just tell of good societal things and good um, commitment and stuff. They're not just about the foundation of society and all that kind of stuff. They are about reflecting the truth, this foundational truth, about Jesus and how he feels about us, his church. So when we commit adultery, not when we commit adultery, sorry, if we commit adultery, <laughs> um, <laughs> what we're doing is, I've got COVID brain as well, um, what we're doing is we're spoiling that image and our marriages no longer reflect the faithful, perfect love that Jesus has for his church. I think, I think, I don't know how many years you'd go back, but I think there's a recent thing in society which has started to say that adultery is okay. There was an article in the Times two Saturdays ago, th three Saturdays ago, which I annoyingly recycled before I managed to cut out and keep it. It was a report, I don't know if you saw this, American psychologists saying that actually committing adultery can be really good for your marriage. And I think society's attitudes to adultery have changed in the last 10 years, maybe last 20 years. I think one of the things is it's become um, almost legitimate. So you, you hear about things like open relationships or polyamorous relationships. You know, open relationships where both the couples say, we, we've talked about this, we're really happy, we decided we're both going to have other partners, but we're both really happy about that, and this is really good for our marriage, and that's, that's fine. And I think what that has done is begun to legitimize adultery. And certainly in the last five years, I think this has increased. I think some of the old reasons for staying, for not committing adultery in society have been eroded. I think um, it used to be that we used to talk about trust or talk about cheating or talk about the damage to families and children. I think we used to talk about how... Uh, we used to have a sort of rather quaint, antiquated view that sex meant something beyond physical pleasure. But that's gone now. It doesn't, they, those values don't hold true anymore in society, do they? We not, they do for some of society, but for lots of society, those, those values don't hold true anymore. So I'm looking at the issue of adultery, and I don't think it's any good just to get up and say, come on, guys, we need to stop committing adultery if we are. We mustn't commit adultery because it's bad for your families, it's bad for your trust, it's bad for all, you know, it's, 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 sex is more important than that. I don't think that holds much weight anymore in society, sadly. But what does hold weight 
is Jesus' love for his church. That is never going to change. Society can completely change their understanding of marriage, completely understand their understanding of adultery, completely understand their changing of sex, but God is not going to. Because our marriages are not a human construct. Our marriages are a reflection of that foundational truth that Jesus loves his church, that Jesus nurtures his church, that Jesus is making his church perfect, that Jesus will care for his church, that Jesus will keep his church warm. And so my challenge for us as Christians is not to make sure we avoid adultery because of those human reasons, although those are really important. I'm not minimizing those. Of course, we must, trust is important in a relationship. Of course, cheating is a bad thing in a relationship. Of course, it damages children. Of course, sex is more than just a physical thing. But for Christians, our first reason why we don't commit adultery is because we want to reflect Jesus and his love for the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's why we hold marriage as such a sanctified thing, such a precious thing, because it reflects the truth of Jesus and his church. It, it's tricky talking about adultery in church because, because, it, because there's all sorts of that it's just pastorally a huge challenge. You know, some of you are not married. Some of you are, are, are at peace with that. Some of you are sad about that. So that's hard. Some of you um, have been wounded in marriages. Some have had broken marriages. And, you know, some of you will have been on the receiving end of the pain of adultery. Some of you are in marriages now where you're not happy. You're not committing adultery, but you're not happy. It just hurts, doesn't it? Life is full of hurt. And so the problem with preaching like this, it, I'm slightly ad-libbing now. The problem is it, it's just difficult because life hurts, doesn't it? And relationships hurt. And marriages can be difficult places and singleness can be a diff difficult place. Marriages can be amazing. Singleness can be amazing. But, but the reality is it, it can hurt. So I, I think I just want to finish without talking about adultery or, or marriage or anything, but just talking, reminding us what I said about Jesus. So I, I think I'm going to get you to stand, actually, and we're going to finish like this, and I'll get Kate to come up. I just want us to wait on the Holy Spirit, and I just want to speak some truth. I, I'll, I'll probably repeat what I've already been saying. Um, But so, so, so wherever you are, I'd love you to close your eyes because then you can just focus on your own thoughts. I'd also invite you to hold your hands out because it's a sign of willingness to accept what God wants to give you. If you're watching on the live stream, you can do this at home. It's absolutely fine. And I just want to pray, come Holy Spirit. And we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister to the deep places inside us where, where these things are difficult for us. Pray, come Holy Spirit, come and minister to us. Where we are hurting, bring your goodness and your compassion Where we're fearful, Holy Spirit, reveal the love of the Father to us that drives out fear. Where we have suffered at the hands of other people's unfaithfulness, Father, bring your goodness and your faithfulness through your Holy Spirit to us now. Come, Holy Spirit, and keep, keep ministering to us. We need your ministering love for us, Jesus. We need it.
Thank you, Jesus, that you love the church, and that means you love us stood here this morning. You love us, and you gave yourself up for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You're working in us to present us blameless. Thank you, Jesus, that you feed us and you care for us. Jesus, thank you that you keep us warm. Would we know the loving embrace of the perfect Father for us this morning, Jesus? Would we know your loving embrace, Jesus? Come, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm.